Good to see everybody. So, me and, me and Zach this morning were talking about um, just like fresh revelation. And um, Tertia and I were away this past few days and um, <clears throat> I was trying to think like, oh yeah, I got to preach on Sunday. So um, what am I going to preach on? I'm singing back like, oh, what did God say that like a couple weeks ago? And I started like trying to go through that and then I found like, <coughs> oh man, that's really stale. That's really, really stale. So I threw it out. I'm like, I don't really know. And uh, so then I, you know, we were at this, this like conference school thing with some people and they, they were talking about, you know, when you're going to prepare a message, like preparing yourself versus like preparing a message. And I feel like I'm in a place right now where I'm like, I've prepared myself. So I don't, I kind of know where I'm going, but I don't really know where I'm going. Um, it might just be a lot of ramblings and thoughts from me that are just going to, I'm going to be like, like, this is where my heart's at right now. Um, so get ready. Um, yeah, I just like, God has been speaking so much and, um, and like, even like we were driving home yesterday and it was pouring in like from San Diego to Irvine thunderstorms. It was like really awesome. And we stopped for food, and we're, like, trying to figure out where to go, and we stopped, like, probably at the wrong place because it was Saturday night, and there were tons of people out, and it was an outdoor mall. So it's, like, of course, the one time we're, like, walking through an outdoor mall, it's raining in California. <laughs> so, like, thunderstorm. And it's, like, it is pouring right now. And as we were driving home, I'm, like, man, there's, I don't know what it is, but there's something prophetic about this rain. And then, like, I heard this, and I still haven't, like, prayed in too much, but I heard this, like, um, what are the conditions for rain? Like, what are the conditions? And I was thinking, like, well, that's kind of a weird way to put it. You know, what are the conditions? It's like there are, there are certain conditions that we can set. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't move sovereignly. He does. But there are certain conditions that we can set to actually bring rain, right? There are actually things that we could step into, things that we can do that actually, like, pull on that open heaven, right? We live under an open heaven, right? That happened 2,000 years ago. It actually happened not, not even, like, it happened before the cross. You know that, right? Like, when Jesus was baptized, it actually, the languages, the heavens were rended, and the Holy Spirit came down and rested on Jesus. Whew. Yes, I'm not sure where I was going with that. Um, but today, I just want to talk about something really, really simple, um, but really, really important. Like, super simple, but super important. Um, the book of James is kind of like a punch in the gut. Does anybody like spend any time in there? Yeah, it's awesome. That was actually when, it, when I first became a believer, that one like really, I was really drawn to. I think, I think cause I'm a bit, I like to, I'm, I'm a bit of a, what is it? A masochist. Is that when you like to beat yourself up? I'm a bit like that. So I'm like, yeah, it hurts so good. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like I spent a lot, a lot of time in there, but it's, it's such a, such an amazing book letter. This is what James chapter 1, 22 to 27 says. And there's, I have one scripture up there for you, but there's more. Because like I said, I'm like, I don't know. So I'm like, Caleb, put that one up. You know what I mean? So we're actually going to, we're going to read more scripture today um, in James. But it starts in 22. If you want to pull out your Bibles, you could follow along. Um, You guys got your Bibles, right? Ooh, did you guys bring your Bibles to church? I'm just kidding. Anyways, there's, there's one under your seat, or, you know, you, everyone has a phone, and, you know, there you go. But it says this, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Mic drop, we can leave. It's that simple, right? Don't merely listen to the word, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. It's kind of crazy. Kind of defeats the purpose, right? There's no point. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. 
This is it's up there. I'm going to read it. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. The religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Because, and the, the word there, um, the word for word is logos. He's talking about the written word. Which is interesting because like when you actually like what, in that time they're writing the New Testament, what do they consider the word? Really they're talking about the Old Testament. But I think James right here is actually talking about Jesus wrapping up the whole Old Testament in a couple things. He's talking about Jesus because Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He fulfilled it all. He wrapped it all up into a couple things. So some of us, we could actually like, what does it look like to merely listen to the word? Like, I don't know, a lot of us, we could come to church week after week or we listen to sermons during the week and it's like, you know, get that like, that little, you know, boost. Like, oh, that felt really, really good and I'm really inspired and I'm really excited. But often that's where it stops, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm, and I'm talking to myself too, right? I've, I can't even count how many times, like, I've listened to something, you know, not, not even like a, like a sermon or whatever, but I've read something or I've listened to something, and I'm like, I am so inspired. Yes! And I'm like, and I feel like I'm doing something, but I'm not. <laughs> I haven't taken any of that stuff, applied it in any way. Um, when we hear the word and do nothing with it, it says we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves. We actually convince ourselves that we're doing something, right? It'd be like, um, so I'm going to come up with this fitness plan. And here's what it consists of. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest some money in going to the gym. I'm going to invest in myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a gym membership. And you know what? I, I really want to succeed, so I'm not just going to go to Target and get some athletic gear. I'm going to Lululemon, and I'm going to splurge on myself. <laughs> I'm going to get all the tight stuff and, uh, you know, everything that's in, you know, whatever. I'm just going to get all the stuff. I'm going to get, you know, the, the expensive footwear. I'm not going cheap on that either. You need good footwear. You need the right footwear, right? Anybody, you know, you need the right footwear to go to the gym. So you get all that stuff, and I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm actually going to commit to going to the gym for six months. Six months. That's a good amount of time. If you go to, you're going to see some results in six months right? So, and actually, I'm going to wake up really early, too. I'm going to wake up really early, and I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go to the gym. So, I wake up super early. For six months, every morning, I wake up, and I go to the gym, and I get there. I'm like, this place is awesome. Whoa, that's some new equipment over there. There's some weights there. That's some, this is some really good stuff. Cool. Whoa, this is awesome. And then I kind of walk over here, and I'm like, oh, this one's kind of cool. Boop. That's awesome. Whoa. Man, this looks really expensive. I don't even know how to use that. That is really cool. And I go over here, and then I spend about an hour, and then I leave. And I do that for six months. <laughs> right? And then at the end of six months, like, I'm still out of shape. Right? It's kind of what we do when we merely listen to the word. It's presented to me. It looks awesome. I'm super inspired. I'm super excited. But I haven't done anything with it. I haven't lifted anything. Right? I've deceived myself into thinking if I go there, if I dress the right way, if I do, if I like, you know, if I, if I present myself a certain way, um, then, I, then I'm going to actually have results. And that's, that's not it. I'm not putting in the work. <laughs> um, our trip to Escondido um, this past couple of days, the last day was um, a little bit, a little bit harsh. Um, there was... <laughs> The, the question was, what are you building? And, you know, we were kind of going around like, what are you building? And then, like, a couple of people went before us were like, oh, no, we're totally going to get just like, wow. Because um, they'd be like, what are you building? And they talk about, you know, what they're building. It's really vague. <laughs> How many people? I don't know. How much money do you need? I don't know. Well, you got to get specific. And anyways, so it kind of came around to us. And, and it was like, okay, you know, what are your next steps? And some people are like, well, I'm going to strategize some more. And he's like, 
what you're doing there, saying you're going to strategize more, is you're actually taking your deadline and you're going like, oop, throw it out there so I don't have to do anything. Right? <laughs> I think that's what we do when we merely listen to the word. I'm going to do that someday, but listening to the word right now, I'm deceiving myself and I'm convincing myself that I'm doing something right now. I'm throwing it out there, though. We got to get specific. Yes. We don't want to merely just listen, but do what God says. Um, this kind of ties in what I talked about with the, you know, what's your wall or, or whatever, you know. We've, some of us have had something on our hearts for years that we like to talk about, but we haven't done anything towards it. Um, actually, later in, in the book of James, James says if we do, if we don't do what we know we ought to do, it's sin. And I know he's talking about, like, living righteously and, like, you know, living godly. But do you think that could apply? Is living righteously and living right, is that actually like obeying God and what he asks you to do? Is that sin? Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, the word, when he says listen to the word, it's the logos, but how often has God gave us a rhema word for now? Go do this. And we don't. And often God will give us a word, and it's like something for the future, like, you're going to do this, and it's like, that's huge, wow, that's amazing, but how often is it something that, like, it becomes that stale bread? Dang it, that bread went bad. I hate that. When I go to make my kids' lunches, and I'm like, I know there's bread in there, and I'm all excited. I'm like, whew, we're going to make lunches today. We're going to get on top of things, and then I go there, and the bread is moldy. <laughs> Isn't that the worst? I hate that. I hate it. Anyways, often that could happen. You got to, when God gives you that bread, man, it could go stale like that. He was talking about that fresh bread versus stale bread. It's like the fresh bread, you bring it out. It's like, mmm, squish it, and the smell comes out. You know, it's, it's really good. You want to eat it when it's like that, right? When God gives you that fresh bread. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, what's the perfect law? Jesus, right? It's the perfect law, which Jesus took, and he wrapped it up into, I, I mean, Two commands, right? What's, what's the most important, what is the, the most important law? Love God, love people, right? And he even like, he even one ups it later and he says, new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, which is like, whoa, how do we love each other like Jesus loves us? Jesus laid his life down only by the Holy Spirit. But he summed up the law in those two things, love God, love people, the perfect law. It's perfect. It's perfect. You don't need any other law. It's absolutely perfect. He said it's perfect. He said there's going to be no other law, no other covenant. I talk about this all the time. I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> it's the perfect law that gives freedom, freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they heard, like looking into a mirror and forgetting, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, and they will be blessed in what they do. We actually have to take the word actually take that perfect law, love, my, love God, love my neighbor, love my peeps. We actually have to apply that. We actually have to do it. We got to do it. So we actually have to ask ourselves, what does that look like? How do we do that? He continues. Those who consider themselves religious, and in their religious, he's like people that consider themselves like devoted to God, people that say, I worship God. People that consider themselves consecrated to him, like Jesus, Jesus is, I'm, I am Jesus' person. <laughs> people that consider themselves that. People that consider themselves devoted to God and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion, that devotion, that worship, that fear of God, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, I would take orphans and widows and say it's not necessarily orphans and widows. I'd say those are probably the most vulnerable people in that society at the time. But I am very, very committed to caring for orphans. Yeah. Right? This church, it's in our DNA. It's in our DNA. Our devotion, our religion 
should lead us to do something. The perfect law of love should actually lead us to love someone. Should actually burn in our hearts compassion to change someone's world who's hurting, who's vulnerable. And it doesn't even, I don't, in, it, in that time, orphans and widows, no one to take care of them. No one. But it could be in your life right now, somebody who's vulnerable emotionally, physically, in your family, in your life somewhere. Someone who's experienced trauma. Who in your life is vulnerable who needs you to actually do the perfect law of love? To love them like Jesus loves them. Like Jesus loves you and them. What does it look like? Care for physical needs. Care for emotional needs. Care for the vulnerable. Um, When Marshall and I went to Wyoming, um, we were out one night. And I just like, sometimes just like stare at the sky like this. You know, because it's like really awesome. Like, if we don't have awe in our lives, you got to get your awe back. If you're not in awe of who God is and what he's done, if, if you feel like you figure God out, whew, that's a bad place to be. That's a bad place to be. If you're like, if you're not getting moved by stuff, got to, got to be, got to get in his presence and say, Lord, just move me, move my heart. <laughs> Anyways, I was looking at the sky and we're like, what the heck is that? And there's like satellite. And then there's another one. And they just kept going. It's like, what is that? That's so weird. <laughs> Like, oh, you know what? That must be Starlink, right? Starlink, is that Elon Musk's thing? The satellites and stuff? Like, what the heck? Isn't that amazing that, like, people do that? We launch freaking satellites that, like, follow themselves and lie. Like, how do people do that? <laughs> you know? Like, all this technology and, like, you know, rockets that land themselves. Like, incredible stuff. Like, really smart people, really amazing innovations. That is crazy what people can do. Yet, there's people still starving. What is that? Whoa. How can we get me, don't get me wrong, I'm not against innovation. I'm not against it at all. I love it. It's really, really awesome. I think that that's part of going from glory to glory. And we actually, you know, get, like God gives us those things. Satellites, whatever. Yeah, whatever. But how crazy is it? seems our priorities are a little bit out of whack. There's still people that are starving and suffering and dying of diseases that we could probably cure. It's frankly messed up. Like, but here it is right here. What is true religion? What is the perfect law? It's to care for those who are, who are vulnerable, who have no one else to care for them. I don't want to bash the church because I love the church. I love the church. I'm not just saying this church. I love the church. I love the church. My true belief is that the local church is the hope of the world, that we're we're not going to get anything done without the local church. It's the people in the local church that are going to change the world. It's people in the local church that are in the trenches in their, their communities that have been placed there, that have been planted there. We are going to change the world. I believe that. I believe that, and that's why I, that's why we're here. Um, that's why we're trusting God for big things. I believe that. I believe that. But I believe why why are these things still happening in the world is because probably half the church is asleep. The church itself is the I, I almost said the most powerful organization in the world it's not an organization it's the most powerful organism in the world it is the body of christ it is the most powerful organism in the world why yeah because of our numbers yeah there, do you know how how fast the church is growing worldwide you know other people would have you think that it's not that the church is dying no it's not it's actually growing exponentially fast worldwide maybe the version of church we thought that we think it should look like is dying yeah it is and i think a lot of that needs to die and what is that? That's just the dead, the dead religion. The listen to the word, not the do it. Let's go do it. 
People are sick of the talking. They want to do stuff. I'm sick of the talking. I want to do stuff. The church isn't doing its job. We've outsourced the care for orphans and widows to humanitarian secular organizations. Now, I'm not saying that there's not amazing Christian organizations that do humanitarian aid. I'm not saying that. But generally, I think that we have this deep-seated belief is like someone else is going to take care of it, right? Someone else is going to do it. Disaster happens, you know, send in Red Cross, um, send in, you know, disasters worldwide, send in UNICEF, you know, someone else will take care of it. I'll support them to do it. We carry something amazing as the church. We're not just a humanitarian organization. Yeah, we feed people. Yeah, we, you know, take care of his phys- physical needs. But for an orphan and a widow and a vulnerable person, they need more than that. They need more than that. What do we carry besides that? Jesus, yeah, Jesus. We carry restoration. Restoration. Not just survival. Here, take this, you'll survive. No, it's like Jesus' heart is to restore, is to restore. And for people in those situations, what do they need more than anything? You think of an orphan, what does an orphan need? He's a father, love, identity. We carry that. The father is the only one who can bestow identity on a person. And who are we? We are the hands and feet of Jesus. So we actually get that opportunity to bestow and speak identity into people. This is who God says you are. And he will never, ever Say, you are a piece of trash, you are garbage, you're an orphan, you're a this. It's like, no, actually, you're, you're my son, you're my daughter. I almost wore this shirt today. <laughs> okay, I won't say it. Probably be offensive, but it was so funny. It's so funny. Okay, so it says, don't be a wee bastard. You got to read, what is it, Hebrews? Uh, it said, don't be a wee bastard. But it means don't act like an orphan because you're not. Right? And the King James, it uses that language. So you can't, you can't get mad at me. It's in the Bible. So, <laughs> But uh, it's pretty funny. But that's what we do. Like, the, the orphans is not, being an orphan is not a circumstance. It's a, it is, but it's also a mindset. Because there's orphans everywhere, all around us. And sometimes we act like orphans, right? Mm -hmm. We don't offer just physical food. We bring the bread of life. We don't offer just water. We offer the living water. We don't offer just survive. But come discover your identity. And it's amazing. Every single person's, every single person is significant. That's one of our core beliefs here at this church is everyone is significant. Every single person. Okay, so now here's the thing you've been waiting for is the plug for the love fundraiser. (laughs) And here, this is not manipulation. This, like I told you, this is on my heart. This is on my heart. Um, some of you were here, listened to kind of what our trip was all about. We went last summer and really got to, um, we've been there a ton, but this time was different. This time was different because I feel like God has invited us to dream. He's invited us to dream with him, dream big. Um, what does caring for orphans and widows actually look like? It's not keeping them there. It's not keeping them there in that, that state, obviously. I love, I love the fundraiser. I love it. It's so fun. It's awesome. We get to bring new people in and share. There it is. We get to share what we're doing. We get to share God's heart for these children's villages. But not only that, God's heart for people and God's heart for restoring nations. Because where does restoring nations start? It starts with right there. That's where it starts. I love it. We, um, they say, you know, without... Without our support, they don't put food on the table, which that's pretty pretty heavy. 
Um, so we, we gladly do it. God's vision's bigger than that. It's way bigger than that. God's vision is bigger than, please, will you donate so these kids can eat? Man, is that God's heart? No. No, it's not. It's, yes, feed these kids. But man, let's bestow identity. Let's teach these kids who they actually are. Let's empower these kids to actually go out and change their, their communities because they can, because they're powerful. And I'm not just saying that like, ooh, they're so powerful. It's like, no, they're powerful. Why? Because when people receive the Holy Spirit, when kids receive the Holy Spirit, it's not a junior Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit of God. It is the fullness of heaven. And actually, they, they understand it better than we do, adults. We have all these doubts in their minds. They trust. It says there's a reason why Jesus said you've got to become like a child to be born again. They get it. You want breakthrough? You want healing? Ask one of those kids to pray for you. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I've prayed for her a ton, like your, her back hurt or something, and nothing happened. Braden comes up, poof, <laughs> healed. Like, what? Where's the doubt? In, where's my doubt? Oh, man. Crazy. Oh, it's bigger than that. How about we partner with kingdom-minded people over there and invest in the futures of the children. So we get a chance to do that. We're flying Graham out, who runs both of our children's villages. Graham and Tammy are the most amazing kingdom-minded people. Incredible. They don't, they don't stop here, well, what, what does the budget say? Like, what does God say? What are we going to do? Let's do something. Let's do something. Let's pray and prophesy over these children and believe in them because God believes in them. Let's stand under authority and bind the enemy and loose heaven. How about we fund a baby house? We could do it like that. We could do it like that. Come on. Fund a baby house. Let's do it. Let's do something. We are the body of Christ, for crying out loud. I know I've, I like harp on this all the time. I always end up in the same place. We're the, come on, body of Christ. Let's do this. I just can't help myself. <laughs> True religion is obedience to the perfect law to take care of the vulnerable. And then he goes on to say, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I found that really interesting. Like, why does he say, what, what, how does that add up? Why does he say that and say, don't be polluted? Yeah, I think James is talking about, like, live righteously. Like, don't, don't get involved you know, with garbage, like don't do all that stuff. I think he's talking about that, but then it's like, you know what? There's actually, I think there's a warning here. I might be off. But when we tend to get involved with vulnerable people, firstly, there's a lot of tox toxicity going on. I mean, vulnerability kind of breeds toxicity, but at the same time, we could tend to get a toxic mindset. And this is a warning because Tertia and I, when we'd go over there, we find we'd get home, and we would just get really just, like, bad taste in our mouth. Look at all this excess. People driving nice cars, living in nice houses, while kids are living in mud huts. I think we could tend to get like that, which isn't right either. That's not right either. Um, I think that it, it, whatever group you minister to, there is a, um, there's a risk of being polluted by mindsets, other mindsets, instead of holding on to a kingdom mindset. Um, like, you know, te you've, you tend to, like, minister to really poor people. You can get this, like, this, like, self-righteous, like, like, you know, those people over there are living in excess. You could be ministering maybe to, like, a really wealthy people group, and then you, like, look down at homeless people. Well, they should get a job. Neither of those are kingdom Neither of those are the perfect law of love. How do I love everyone around me as Jesus loves me? How do I love God? How do I love people? I don't think either of those are good mindsets. It's okay, child, little child. It's okay. <laughs> no idea where I am. I'm in Thousand Oaks, California. Um, We can fall into a po poverty mindset. We can fall into a political mindset. Demonize all the people that think differently than us. 
when the crazy thing is, yeah, I think there's, I have my own political views, but I think there's ways that, like, kingdom thinking is so above any worldly thinking, right? God says, my ways are not like your ways. How could we understand God's ways? But the thing is, we have the mind of Christ and we can, and we could actually call ourselves higher, like embrace that we have the mind of Christ and actually start to think like him. What is, what is, what is um, looking like Jesus? What is that? What does it look like? It looks like thinking like him. It actually looks like embracing the mind of Christ. Mm-hmm. You guys awake? Okay. All right, good. So James, he continues in chapter 2 with this. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that. That was like a Jocko. Good. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> where am I? Oh, I totally screwed myself up. Um, demon, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and act, his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You can see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As a body without the spirit is dead, so, the faith, so faith without deeds is dead. You know what's really interesting? You guys know Martin Luther. We're in is it Octo yeah, October celebrating um, Reformation, right? The, third, the 95 Thesis nailed on the door. Amazing. You, did you guys know that uh, Martin Luther actually thought that James should not be in the canon of Scripture? Do you guys know that? Yeah. Because of this right here. Because what, what was the Reformation about? Was I'm saved by my faith alone and nothing else, which I agree with. I agree with that. But faith is your faith. Do you believe it if there's no deeds? Now, I'm not saying the deeds are to save you. I'm saying that when we have this belief, when we have this change, when we have this transformation, when it's real, when it's legit, when it's authentic, we should look different, right? It should actually spur us on into action. I can't help but do these things. Now, I'm, this is not coming down on a, as a condemnation on anybody, this is something we constantly need to be like, Lord, check me on this. Constantly, right? That's where the relationship comes in. And the crazy thing is, this is carried right down into our evangelical culture. I think it could go, go two ways. I think it could go like either, you know, faith alone, or it could be like, I'm just like going to do works because it's my duty. But... It's all about if I believe or know the right things, I'm okay. That's, I think that's our culture. I think that's our evangelical Christian culture. If I follow the right people and I know the right things, then I'm good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it makes me right. Um, but there's this saying um, of people talk, I don't know. It says, show me what you do. And I'll tell you what you really believe or value. You could talk all you want what you believe. You could talk all you want what you value. But if you're not doing it, do you really believe it or value it? Like just a question, right? Like I could tell you till I'm blue in the face how important it is to eat a certain way. But I'm probably going to go get in and out for lunch. <laughs> and a chocolate shake. Let me tell you, this is so like, you know, like I, never mind. I'm, um, 
if I tell you, if I give you advice, but I'm not doing it myself, are you going to take my advice? No. No, you're not. <laughs> it's like the Dave Ramsey thing. Why would you take financial advice from a broke person? It's like, that's probably the dumbest thing ever, right? Um, before you tell me what to do with my finances, can I see your bank account, your investments, and what you do, and see if you're successful or not, <laughs> right? Same thing. Our faith, our beliefs, are our beliefs actually right if it doesn't actually, if the rubber doesn't meet the road? If it's all like ideas and like our theology and all that kind of thing. And don't get me wrong, like I am, theology is so important to me. Like it really is. Um, talking eschatology, atonement. Like what really happened on the cross, hermeneutics, how do we actually, how, how do we actually read the Bible, interpret scripture? That stuff's so important because you get so tweaked in those areas. So theology is super, super important, but if our theology doesn't actually lead us to doing something, something's off. And again, like I'm talking to myself, like, oh man, you haven't prayed for people for healing on the street for a while. Something's off. Where's your belief at? Where's your faith at? Am I believing you for this, God? Like, me. I have a quick testimony. No, we already told that testimony. No, we didn't. Last Wednesday. Oh, this was cool. This was cool. Sorry, a little side note here. Um, so we were doing we're doing this co-op thing, this school co-op thing, which is really awesome. I don't know if some of you drove up and saw, what's that big target against the tree? Kids are throwing axes. <laughs> That's awesome. Um I, it's entrepreneurship. I'll let Marshall explain what they're learning in our entrepreneurship, but um, <laughs> throwing axes. It's awesome, though. Anyways, <laughs> but it, we're, we're doing worship in the morning, and we're just praying, and, and then I decide, I'm going to share a testimony. And, like, um, Zach prayed for me, like, like a couple months ago, and my, my, I was like this, and he prayed for me, and my, I was like this, and then my arm just grew out. It was crazy. It was like, oh, my gosh, that's nuts. Like, God is so good. So I was like telling the kids about that. Why did he do that? Because he's so good. Is it supposed to be like a cool magic trick? No, it's because he actually cares about us and he wants us to be well and he wants us to be whole. And like I saved a trip to the chiropractor. And then um, <clears throat> Tersha told me that the day before she had been at the pediatrician and took the girls and Kayla's, uh, she's like, man, Kayla needs to see a chiropractor. Her legs are like this. One is like over an inch longer than the other. It's like, oh, she just told me that that morning. Like, okay. So we like... We, like, put her on a chair and picked her up, and sure enough, her, leg, her legs were like this. I'm like, oh, man, that's crazy. And I'm like, okay, kids, well, we're, gonna, we're actually going to do what the word says, and we're going to pray for the sick to be well. Obviously, she's not sick, sick, but, like, we're going we're gonna to pray for wholeness. We're going to pray for wellness. Um, and, like, we're praying, nothing's happening. And then we're like, okay, kids, everybody, we're going to say, grow in Jesus' name. And they're like, okay. And they're like, grow in Jesus' name. Whomp. It grew. Like, whoa, <laughs> doing the stuff, right? They're doing it. And you don't, hear, you don't see anything in Scripture about legs growing out or whatever. I don't see it in the Bible. Well, you know what? Um, it was said that Jesus did so much stuff it couldn't fill all the books in the world. So why do we discount that? It says actually there's gifts of, he there's gifts of healing, not gift, gift of healing. So there could be, I don't know how many kinds of gifts of healing there are. Like, why do we put God in a box? Right? I don't even know where I am. Where am I? Okay, sorry. I'll try to land this plane. Okay, my watch is dead. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Some might say, well, we need to be careful of doing because Mary in the Bible, she was doing the right thing. She was at the feet of Jesus, loving on him. She's doing the right thing. Martha out there, come on, Martha, right? We always like poo-poo Martha. But I, yes? I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. I'm getting there. That's right. Yes. We all need to be Marys, but we all need to be Marthas, right? Amen. Without Martha, nothing would get done. 
right? <laughs> so yes, I'm not discounting like, yes, we need to spend feet, time at the feet of Jesus, in the presence of Jesus. The most important thing. But let's not stop. Let's, let's, let's let that lead us to do Martha stuff. Let's serve, right? Let's do things. Let's build things, right? Let's build the kingdom, right? Yes, it's important, but Jesus also says, do the things that I've commanded you. Obey me. Like, do the things, right? And it wasn't only sit at my feet. It was go and preach the gospel. Go and obey what I said. The perfect law of love. Love one another as I have loved you. Love God. Love people. Do those things. We're do be do be people. We're do be people. What does true worship and devotion look like? Looks like obedience to the perfect law of love. Okay, so you guys have an assignment today. You guys ready? Okay. So I'm going to ask you what I was asked yesterday, and I was sweating in my chair, like, I hope I have the right answer. I hope I don't get beat up. Ooh, ooh. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to beat you up. Um, what is it that God has for you to do today? Today. We're, um, I think the, the, um, <clears throat> the mantle, the anointing, whatever you want to call it on this place, the, the, the heart, the DNA is to build, right? We gather, we worship, we sit at the feet of Jesus. We sit in the presence. Number one, so important. Number two, we do stuff. We build. We're called to this community. We're called to transform this community. We're called to build. So I'm going to ask you, you know, you know what anointing is? Anointing is smudging. Like anointing is like you're getting smudged with oil and stuff. So the anointing that's on us on this place, I'm just going to smudge it on you right now. Go do something. Go do something. Go do something. Right? <laughs> So that's between you and the Lord. That's your homework. Spend some time with him. Spend some time. If you haven't been doing that, do that first. Yes. Get familiar with his presence. Sit in his presence. Yes. And then ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Right? I just have this, maybe I'm crazy. May, I don't know. I just really have this belief. I have this vision. I have this picture of actually seeing things change, not only here, but South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mozambique. Wherever we're touching, I believe wholeheartedly things are going to change. I believe we could shift culture. I believe we could turn a culture of, of hate, despair, all these things, turn it to a kingdom culture. I believe that. I believe it with everything in me. But we got to do stuff. We got to, at the end of the day, yes, we declare things from heaven. We sit in our seats in, in authority. We're actually seated there in the spirit. That is a spiritual reality. You are there. You have authority up there. That is real. But guess what? Your two physical feet are on the earth right now where he said, take dominion and, and occupy. That's where your feet are right now. Your physical feet, Woo. Boom, that's where you landed. That's where he put you. That's, this is where the mission is. This is where we say, heaven needs to be there. 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 Right? Yeah. Yes. Yep. This has been burning, Matthew 16, 17 through 19. It says, And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, because he just revealed he was Jesus. Peter did. But the Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Mm. Who's the church? The church that started with Peter. On this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yeah. As the church, we're supposed to be the ones coming and pushing back the gates of hell, yeah. right? Like not waiting, not waiting for hell. It's like all of us are kind of sitting around waiting and watching hell take over earth. 
But the church, the church is the one who's supposed to come and push back on the gates of hell. And I will give you, Jesus says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I'm going to be totally honest. I told, don't fully grasp what that means, but it's freaking incredible. That Jesus would give us the keys and say what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Like he's given us that much authority. Whatever we loose onto the earth, release onto the earth will be released in heaven. And on, on Wednesday night, we gave people the opportunity. And we really like Cody did an amazing job of just sharing our what we pray, what we actually declare out loud, what we actually declare moves God like the intercession that God has God has given us a place where we can actually intercede on behalf of others and it actually changes the world and so we gave people an opportunity to to just take some time and declare over the children that we support in South Africa Zimbabwe or maybe for you like who you support right now the people that you need to take care of right now the most vulnerable and it was incredible like so moving to watch people stand up and not just go that we will feed them, <laughs> but to go like these are chosen. These kids are chosen. We're going to see people healed. We're going to see nations transformed, like Cody was just saying. It's, it's so amazing. And then one girl stood up. It was her first time there. Um, and she had no idea some of the testimony. Some of you guys know the testimony, but she starts sharing about how as she was praying, she just sees this ring of fire that's like this Holy Spirit. I'm going to mess it up, but it's like this Holy Spirit ring of fire of protection around the kids. And she had no idea that there was a literal fire that protected the kids around one of our villages when there were uh, major riots going on and there were threats that people were going to come in. And there was, God literally started a fire that burned all night, kept everybody out, out and kept the kids safe. But it never entered into the gates. It never even melted the plastic on the gates. <laughs> like, these are the realities of the church coming and not, not ever allowing the gates of hell to prevail, but stopping and going, nope, no more, no further. So as we invite the, the worship team up here, I just want you to take a moment and you declare, actually, if any of you guys were there on Wednesday night or if any of you guys have something to share, if there's something that God put on your heart for the kids or, or people right now, just declare it out loud as we go into a time of worship, right? That these kids are world changers. They are not orphans. They are chosen sons and daughters, right? That the, these, are, these are, yeah, these are world changers. Ikatello means the chosen ones. So God, we just give you all the glory. And God, we say that we will be the ones who, who sit at your feet in your presence, but then we take you out into the world with us. God, we are your presence carriers. So we want to be the ones who step out into our homes, into our neighborhoods, and to the ends of the earth to be your presence carriers. God, if you don't go, we don't want to go. But we know you're already sending us, and we know you go with us because you promised it. You promised it. You promised that your presence would be with us. So Jesus, we're just reminding you and we're reminding ourselves again that we will go where your presence takes us. And where your presence is, there is transformation. There's fullness of joy. There's life everlasting. We love you, Jesus. Amen.